Hello? Happy Pride, everybody. You know what, before we get started, let's just have a breath together in the same room together, celebrating that we're in the same room together for the first time in a long time. Can we just breathe in, everybody? <gasps> and breathe out. I'm not a designer, you know. But I want to talk today about my favorite designer, which is the planet Earth. The Earth which designed me, which designed us all. And I want to ask, what does the Earth want us to do now? What is the Earth asking of us now? Greetings from the rainforest where I come from. Not a rainforest you probably know very well, a rainforest in Pennsylvania. Not a tropical rainforest, a deciduous rainforest. And I'm going to start by bringing us back to a time, a time a long, long time ago a time that I can't hardly remember. 2019. In 2019, the International Panel on Climate Change announced that we had just 11 years left to change every system on the planet. Every single human system, or else we would miss our climate change goals. We had 11 years left to implement the Green New Deal across all sectors, or else that's it. Game over curtains. And we can't take this on as a single region or a single group. It's got to be all of us. Because if we continue along the current track that we're on, remember the breath that we just took, if we continue the track that we're on, we warm the oceans so much that phytoplankton stop creating oxygen by the century's end. Less than 80 years away from everything and everyone on the planet suffocating to death. That's two-thirds of the oxygen on the planet. In 2019, everything was on fire. The USA, Australia, Europe, even the Amazon rainforest was on fire. In 2019, climate emissions were through the roof and increasing. Yeah, climate emissions through the roof and increasing. As of 2019, in my lifetime, 70% of all the wildlife on Earth had disappeared from the planet. And in 2019, a handful of mega billionaires owned about as much wealth as everybody else on the planet. In 2019, there were hundreds of mass shootings in America, and most people couldn't afford basic medical care, and the police shot thousands of people, mostly poor and black and brown, and income inequality was at an all-time high. In other words, a total shit show. But in 2019, hope was on the way. Bernie Sanders, the second most popular democratic socialist in American history behind Martin Luther King, was running for president for the second time. And I was going to go out there with Bernie and we are going to talk about the Green New Deal, about solving climate change, about restoring dignity to the political process. We were going to go out there and fight the problems of racism and social inequality. We were going to take it on. And just as that socialist revolution was about to become the front runner for president of the United States and lead the free world, that little bugger was born. COVID-19. And everyone had to go home. Party's over. Everyone has to go home. And just as Woodrow Wilson and the centrists had done 100 years ago to Eugene V. Debs, the warmongers and the centrists and the bankers came in, and they collapsed that American socialist revolution around our feet. So I come from this rainforest 
And in March of 2020, I decided that the world was shutting down and I needed to heed that global call to introspection. So I moved into a one-room cabin in the middle of the woods that I had built in 2016 with some friends. We called it the Henry David Thoreau Civil Disobedience Love Shack. No electricity, no internet, because the world was shutting down and I wanted to get back to the forest. I needed a great healing. I needed to heal all the disappointments and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. And this was the moment of healing somehow, the pandemic. So I went back to where I grew up in the woods. You're seeing pictures of that place right behind me on the images behind me. And I isolated myself in this cabin in the woods where my father had built a house in the 70s. My father mm -hmm. was a infant survivor of the Holocaust. Oh. Yeah. My grandfather escaped so Poland in the world. middle of the night. He got a tip at 7 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. He said the Nazis are coming the next morning to round up all the Jews. Get out, get out now. And if it wasn't for him leaving at 11 o'clock that night, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you talking to you. And we found a refuge in the woods of Pennsylvania in the Borscht Belt, where the Marx Brothers had come from, where there were Jewish socialist summer camps up there in the woods, the same Jewish socialist summer camps that got Bernie Sanders from Brooklyn to Vermont. My father's whole family was killed in World War II by the Nazis, by the white supremacists. And they found that refuge, refuge in the woods of Pennsylvania. And I grew up among these leaves, and these birds, and these streams, and this water. So I was gonna survive this pandemic. The survivor in my DNA was not going to risk it. The intergenerational trauma. When you have that, there's a screaming in you so deep that when it comes, you can't really hear anything else, and that screaming was saying, you better survive. And in the spring of 2020, an amazing thing happened that you probably remember. The great gears of extractivism and capitalism ground to a halt, and the skies cleared, and the planet started to heal, and we started to be able to see the blue sky again. The earth started to heal. The blue sky was like I hadn't seen since I was a kid. You remember this, right? The planet was breathing again. And we started to understand that a world was possible without pollution, a world uh, in that global economic shutdown. You remember this, right? April of 2020, the only time we actually made our climate goals in the history of the United States, in the history of the world. The only time we reduced emissions ever enough to make the goals of the, uh, the Paris Accord. So as you look at these pictures behind me, I want you to ask yourself, what is the Earth asking of us now? How will we survive? We're worried about climate change. We're worried about the floods. We're worried about massive storms. We're worried about wildfires. We're worried about the plastic in the ocean. We're so worried that this situation is so difficult and dangerous that we can't possibly change it. We're in the middle of this incredible despair. So what does the Earth want from us now? Can we go to video number two, please? And there were these beavers that they were living in the pond uh, directly across from, from, from my house. Uh, in the pond, see, there's my, my house and there's the beaver's house right across the pond from each other. And the pond has an outflow, it's a man-made pond, and the beavers kept damming up the outflow. And every day I had to go and like clean out all this muck that the beavers p were putting in. Because I was worried that, you know, like my house was going to like end up in a swamp, that the pond would overflow. You know, human beings, we get anxious. We get nervous. So I went and I poked a hole in the beaver dam. The beaver dams that are these incredible designs, right? These beaver dams where they put the sticks in so that the water flow actually burrows them further deep into the riverbank and they become stronger when that water hits them. So I went to the, da the dam surreptitiously, not wanting the beavers to see me. You know. And I went and I poked a hole in it. Because I was like, you know, let the water flow out a little bit. You know. There used to be 300 million beavers in the United States. They were 
trapped and killed by the colonialists down to 12 million. So these beavers were the surviving beavers in the surviving woods. And uh, as soon as I poked that hole, it was almost by some bizarre instinct, the beaver just looked and came swimming right up to me. I was like, what are you doing, man? This is our pond too. You know, uh, in fact, we're, we're kind of in charge of this place. And he started repairing the hole right there in front of me. And, and he just turned to me and he looked straight at me. And he said, what are you doing here in the forest? What kind of animal are you? Now, nothing in nobody had ever just looked at me and asked me that, just looked at me and asked me, what is the purpose of your existence? So I stopped, and I just watched them. And I watched the whirlpool rippling that they made along the surface of the pond, the same whirlpool rippling that was happening throughout the stars and the galaxy of the waves of the light rays. And I watched the rippling on the pond, the same rippling that was going through my brain as the synapses were firing. And I, I realized there was a lesson in that. Beavers control where the water goes. So that means that they're the great designers of land, of the continent. They shape the rivers, and they shape the mountains, and they shape the valleys, and they forge the forest. Video number three, please. And I thought about all the the water in the continent of North America and how it's being despoiled by the oil industry. And I remember when I was invited to Standing Rock in St North Dakota when the Sioux tribe was fighting against the oil industry. And how they were fighting to stop an oil pipeline from going underneath their only water source, their only water supply and watching the water protectors, a new breed of activists born, the water protectors standing in front of the police saying, please, 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 we love you. All we want is clean water. And watch the whole line <laughs> pepper sprayed and maced and arrested. And the water protectors still standing there saying, please, 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 please. All we want is to protect our ancestral lands, our only place on earth that we have clean water, the water supply for 16 million people. And again, the whole line, <laughs> maced. They're standing there in the cold November waters. And they come back again and again and again they come back after they're after they're pepper sprayed and maced and coming back again and again and they say you're no we're no different than you don't shoot us with your beanbag rounds don't shoot us with your rubber bullets and the water protectors ne never gave up they said we're going to protect this land we are going to protect this water we're going to protect this place this is the place that's always protected us and I can remember one water protector looking up at a policeman and saying, what are you going to do in the middle of the night when your daughter comes to you and says, Daddy, can I have a glass of water? Are you going to tell them that you are standing here with us, protecting this source of all life? Or are you going to say that you maced and pepper sprayed and wrote numbers on our arms and incarcerated us to protect a foreign oil company that's going to bring the fuels of death? They said, don't you understand? We love you. We're not separate from you. Their DNA calling out the trauma deep inside of them, making them and me brave enough to stand in front and say, you can shoot me. You can arrest me. You can beat me, but you'll never own me. We are the earth rising up to defend itself. So I started to realize as I watched 500 years of colonialism play itself out in front of me, 
I felt the earth rising up in that moment of healing, and I realized I had to try to go understand this earth. Go to the next video, please. Video number three, please. Uh, sorry, number four. I had to get the earth into my hands. I had to feel it. I had to touch it. I had to see it. Because all of a sudden, this idea of nature, a strange concept. In English, nature is defined as all forces on the planet except human beings. This is the cardinal sin of colonialism, to separate us from the planet. The idea of nature is that we are separate from it. Uh, that concept exists to divide us from the land. And I realize there's no such thing as nature. There was just my relationship to the land. And I'm not separate from the planet. I'm not separate from the planet. So I dug myself a hole. dug myself a grave. And I got inside of it. It was the m one of the most favorite things I've ever done, I think. And I could feel the dirt all around me like a warm blanket. And I, I finally felt what it was to understand that we are not separate from the earth. The, the man who building the mycelium coffins, looking forward to rejoining the, the planet. I will be earth for a lot longer than I'll be this standing right here in front of you. People say human beings created climate change, right? It's man-made climate change. But human beings have been around for 300,000 years. Indigenous Amazonians are not creating climate change. Neither are indigenous North Americans or indigenous cultures all over the world are not creating climate change. So it can't be humans that is causing climate change because those people are humans. We have to be a little bit more specific. Can we go to video number four, please? Humans, no. Colonialism created climate change. Extractive economies created climate change. White supremacy created climate change. Infinite growth is creating climate change. And with all of those values, the values of that economic system, <laughs> values like racism, incarceration, Competition, greed, violence, ownership, nature, dominion, the idea that we are superior to everything and every, any, anything on the planet, that's a colonial idea, and that's what's causing climate change. I refuse to be defined by that ideology, the ideology that killed my ancestors. That's the ideology of the oil industry, of capitalism. That is the ideology in... And so, as you know, during COVID, the billionaire class increased their wealth by trillions of dollars. Emissions have grown to an all-time high post-COVID. Nature and forests are still being cut down and destroyed. The fires and floods are worse than ever. But, but we saw how we could do it. We saw exactly how we can solve climate change. COVID taught us how we can do it. Will we learn from the healing process of slowing everything down, shutting everything down? Will we do a scientific inquiry as to how we could duplicate that process? Are we prepared to stand on the front lines 
when the fossil fuel industry would rather kill us or mace us or beat us? Will we realize that the earth where we stand here, will we be in solidarity with solidarity with the water protectors? Will we say, we're not going to take this anymore? Will we seize that shift? Will we seize the knowledge that COVID gave us? That we understand we have a much greater relationship to this earth than we do to this economic model. Will we continue to work with the products of the fossil fuel industry, including Bitcoin and blockchain? Mother Earth designed us all. We have a choice because the Green New Deal will be the greatest design challenge that's ever happened. It'll be the greatest moral challenge of all time, the greatest organizing challenge of all time, and more than anything, it'll be the greatest political challenge of all time. And if we don't meet those challenges, we die, and not just us. Can we design a, a politics? Movements are the design of justice. Can we design a transformation? What is the earth asking us now? Thank you.